I must admit that I was not expecting Balos to be as unambiguously horrible as he is in Elsewhere and Elsewhen. And yes, I am using Balos and Philip interchangeably throughout this video. This episode makes pretty clear that they are the same person. That theory is basically confirmed at this point. Especially with Philip using the energy and life force from those palace men for his strange and eerie and ethereal experiments. It's also interesting because Luce does not know he is Balos at this point. I was wondering if she would find that out. Lilith kind of does. She has suspicions, and she links how Balos behaved toward her in the past with how Philip behaves toward them in the present, or a certain definition of present, the events of the episode, wherein he uses flattery and a lot of compliments and charm in order to get them to do what he wants them to do. But she is a cautious person. She's skeptical. Despite her ambition, she is not this wild rebel against society. She is a rule follower to the heart. So she is not going to make any grand proclamations until she has more evidence. We, on the other hand, have more than enough evidence. And we also have enough evidence to say that Balos seems to have no regard for the well-being of others. Luce does feel a certain level of affinity with Balos throughout the course of this episode, because they're both outsiders who are trying to create a place for themselves in this hostile environment. They're trying to craft an identity and a sense of self in the face of a callous and mocking world that is very much biased against people who do not have access to magic. Like Luce, Balos delights in using glyphs as they give him the opportunity to use magic in a way that he wouldn't be able to normally, although he has a harder time with the glyphs than Luce does, perhaps because the Titan really is hiding them from him, as Balos speculates throughout this episode. He has no qualms with using Luce and Lilith as sacrifices for his grandiose, ambitious mission and then lying about it in his journal. He openly admits that he doesn't care if other people get hurt as long as he gets what he wants. Even by the standards of uh, big bad, take over the world Disney villains, he demonstrates a level of pure apathy toward the well-being of anyone other than himself that is quite astonishing. I do hope that there is more to him than what we saw in this episode. I'm not saying I want him to be sympathetic, I'm not saying I need him to be this super morally gray figure. I am saying that I was hoping that he would at least be a little less overtly monstrous than someone like Andreas in Amphibia. A fitting comparison as the two shows are kind of sisters in a way. With Andreas, he is a cackling menace, but we do get the sense that he has been betrayed by his friends, that he's lost uh, bonds of friendship that he very much enjoyed. So even for how completely, almost cartoonishly evil Andreas is, we at least get a clear sense of who he is as a person and what he really wants. We get a sense of his basic identity ideals and ideology that we don't really have with Balos. We do hear 
little about Balos' brother, Philip's brother, now and then. So, what happened to his brother? Did his brother die? I've heard some people speculate that perhaps the reason why Balos is so resentful toward wild magic and why he seeks to banish it is because users of wild magic were responsible for the death of his brother. Now, I'm not quite sure what I think about that hypothesis. It's a little oversimplistic, if you ask me. But it would be at least an answer, which we haven't really gotten for Balos. But I do think that the more information we get about Balos, the more we are going to learn about his relationship with the Collector, this mysterious mystic figure. We saw the Collector briefly in Knock Knock Knockin' on Hootie's Door, episode 208. But I was not really sure how literally I was supposed to take any of these sequences I saw in Ida's part of that episode. I think Ida's entire part of that episode works better if you take it as very subjective, very impressionistic, kind of conveying her own feelings and desires and her own sorrow and her struggle to overcome that sorrow and her symbolic visualization of her bond with the Owl Beast. I like Ida's storyline in that episode best if it's taken creatively and imaginatively and not purely literally. But if we are to take it purely literally, then we have to ask questions about the Collector, this mysterious hooded figure that looks like uh, medieval depictions of a wizard or magus. And we see on the wizard's cloak this crescent moon symbol that we also see when Balos is contacting the Collector in this episode. And once Balos does make this point of contact, we see the cycles of the moon unfolding around a mischievous, medieval-like, pre-Raphaelite-like sign of a winking sun. So it's very fortune teller-like, tarot-like. There's something a bit surreal and strange and eerie about the world surrounding the Collector. And I hope we learn more about the Collector, and I think we will if the Collector is going to be so significant to Balos as it seems like he is. And so we have to wonder about the relevance of the Collector's presence to Balos's grandiose schemes. What is Balos planning? He wants more than to just get back to the human realm. He's wanted more than that for a while. Luz straight up asks Philip in this episode if he's planning to construct a door to get back to the human realm, because that's what Luz wants for herself. That is her major objective at this point, even more so than stopping Balos, and he says no. So what is he doing? What does he want, exactly? Conquest? World domination? The entire world to worship him as a god? I don't know. But it will be interesting to see how that plays out, and the mystic, cosmic authority and allure of the Collector is going to be a major part of the story going forward, it seems like, because it is a major part of Balos' narrative going forward. It's a major part of what Balos wants for himself. The secrets we learn about Balos are going to take us further in to the mystery of the Collector, what happened to him, and why Balos valorizes him and idolizes him like he does. I can't wait to see what the show does with Balos and the Collector going forward. 
So thank you all for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can and you want to see more videos like this before anyone else can. Keep watching The Owl House. Season 2B is off to a great start on these first two episodes. What do you all think Balos wants from the Collector? Sound off in the comments below. Anyway, tune in soon for my next analysis. It will be coming soon. That I promise you. Thank you all again. Adios, comrades.